Folks, it's more important now than ever that we pay attention to what we are being told and what we are not being told. I say this because a lot of the times, because of our own points of view and our own preferences, uh, we will hear things and if we like them, we don't go past them or examine them closely. And if we don't like them, we basically just go off and uh, want to go out against them. Now, more so than not, it's our defense of the things that we like without the, the further examination of the facts that cause us to arrive at possibly incorrect uh, opinions, assumptions, or alternate facts. Now, Sean Spencer yesterday gave his daily White House uh, presser, press conference, and he said a lot of things. And then he was asked questions which, for the most part, he gave us either inaccurate information or incorrect information or biased, slanted information. Now, what I was going to originally do was just play the whole uh, press conference out and let you listen to it first, then go back and point out the uh, problems that I had with the statements that uh, he made, but that would just be too damn long. So I'm going to try to keep uh, these uh, videos uh, down to a manageable level. So what I'm going to do is, as he's making statements, I'll stop it, I'll make a comment, and then I'll continue it. Hopefully, uh, you'll be able to uh, watch it uh, without uh, taking a look at the time, because I always look at the amount of time that a video uh, takes, and I'll make a decision just based on the length of the video, whether I want to uh, watch it and watch it in its entirety. So, okay, here we go. Here's uh, Sean Spencer at the White House uh, press conference. In deference to, uh, to his remarks when he gets there, we'll wrap it up. After, uh, after briefing uh, yesterday, the president brought leaders of both parties together to discuss nomination, his next nomination to the Supreme Court. It's an incredibly productive conversation, as you can see from the president's tweets. He will announce that nomination next Thursday. Uh, the president also spoke with Prime Minister Modi of India yesterday. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to give you a readout during the briefing, so let me just let you know that during the call, the president emphasized that the uh, United States continues to consider India a true friend and partner in addressing challenges around the world. The two discussed opportunities to strengthen the partnership between the United States and India in, an, in a broad area such as the economy and defense. They also discussed security in the region of South, uh, South and Central Asia. President Trump and Prime Minister Modi resolved that the United States and India should stand shoulder to shoulder in the global fight against terrorism. And President Trump looks forward to hosting Prime Minister Modi in the United States later this year. Today, uh, the President's focused on fulfilling one of his most uh, significant campaign promises to the American people by making America safe again, by taking steps to secure our borders and improve immigration enforcement inside the United States. The president intends to sign two executive orders after observing the swearing-in of Secretary uh, of Security, Secretary of Homeland Security Kelly. Uh, the first order is the border security and immigration enforcement improvements. Uh, it addresses long overdue border security issues, and it's the first order of, order of in that will be to build a large, large physical barrier on the southern border. Bill now let me stop it there. Uh, Donald Trump's promise was that we were going to build a wall on that border and that Mexico was going to pay for it. The executive order that he signed basically utilizes funds, federal government funds that you and I have contributed, our taxes, in order to uh, pay for the building of that wall. But his campaign promise was that Mexico was going to pay for that wall. So 
That in itself is a violation of one of his campaign promises, or at least a partial uh, violation of one of his campaign promises. A recent poll was taken by the uh, Pew Foundation, I'm sorry, the PPP, that asked the American people if we have to pay for that wall, do you want it built? And the majority of those people said, no, they did not want our monies used to build that wall. All right, let me continue. Building this barrier is more than just a campaign promise. It's a common sense first step to really securing our porous border. This will stem the flow of drugs, crime, illegal immigration into the United States. And yes, one way or another, as the president has said before, Mexico will pay for it. The executive officer also provides the dedicated men and women of the Department of Homeland Security with the tools they need, the tools and the resources they need to stop illegal, illegal immigration from the United, entering the United States. Under the Constitution, the American people get the final say who can and cannot enter our nation. And they've spoken loud and clearly through our laws. We're going to create more detention space for illegal immigrants along the southern border to make it easier and cheaper to detain them and return them to their country of origin. We're going to end the last administration's dangerous catch and release policy, which has led to the deaths of many Americans. We're going to once again prioritize the prosecution and deportation of illegal immigrants who've also otherwise violated our laws. And after these criminals spend time in prison for the crimes that they've committed, they're going to get back one-way tickets to the country of their origin, and their governments are going to take them back. The second executive order, enhancing public safety in the interior of the United States, addresses the enforcement of our immigration laws in the United States and returns the power and responsibility to the dedicated men and women of the Department of Homeland Security's Immigration and Custom Enforcement to help them enforce the law. These men and women want to enforce the law and we're going to help them do that. Federal agencies are going to unapologetically enforce the law, no ifs, ands, or buts. We're going to, kind of we're going to restore the popular and successful Secure Communities Program, which will help ICE agents target illegal immigrants for removal. Now, let me stop them right there. So that actually means that if they target someone, they would have the ability to raid a, a person's place of work or their home, i.e. breaking down doors, going in, snatching people up and uh, taking them to uh, the detention centers. The State Department is going to withhold visas and use other tools to make sure countries accept and return the criminals that came from their country. We'll ensure that these countries take those individuals back, and we're going to strip federal grant money from the sanctuary states and cities that harbor illegal immigrants. Okay. That one is going to be problematic at the best. Uh, the mayors of the various uh, sanctuary cities, and I believe there are 17 around the country, uh, got together and issued uh, joint statements indicating that they were not going to go for this. Now, this is my question. Um, I know of uh, several uh, sanctuary state cities, uh, principal among which are New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Dallas, I believe, and Houston. Um, I think Phoenix is one as well. Now, what do all of those cities have in common? What they have in common is the fact that they are federal fun funds positive for the U.S. government. What does that mean? That means that the federal taxes that are paid by the citizens of each of these locales well exceeds the amount of money that the federal government sends back down to them. Uh, California, the state in particular, as is New York State, are definite cash positive sources of uh, taxes for the federal government. If Mr. Trump decides that he wants to issue executive orders 
and have the various departments uh, withhold monies uh, from these locales, the locales in turn could tell the federal government that since they are not going to receive federal funds from them, that they in turn will withhold the federal funds going back to the, I'm sorry, initially going to the federal government. This could turn into a huge pissing match and end up, I guess, in front of the Supreme Court. But net net, all of those cities that I mentioned, and in particular the states of New York and California, if they hang on to all of the federal monies that are sent up to the federal government and in turn utilize those monies uh, in place of the federal government sending monies back down to them, they will be significantly cash positive. So again, this can turn or will turn into a huge pissing match if the federal government tries to become a uh, huge uh, enforcer of these laws and because of the sanctuary city status uh, tries to withhold the funds. This one, I am really interested in how this one goes. The American people are no longer going to have to be forced to subsidize this disregard for our laws. Reform of our immigration system has been at the top of President Trump's priorities since he announced his candidacy. Now, in just the final first week, or excuse me, just in the first week, not there yet, of his presidency, the last administration uh, will enforce the rule of law and restore value to the American citizenship, our greatest asset in the 21st century. As to the rest of the day schedule, this morning, the president started off his day in the Oval Office, carrying out some official duties. Uh, he, this morning, he had the honor to greet uh, now Ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, in his office after the vice president swore her in in his ceremonial office across the street. Uh, as one of the most respected governors in the country, Ambassador Haley has a proven track record of bringing people together, regardless of their background or differences to create opportunities for bettering her state and now our nation. The President is pleased that Ambassador Haley, to the best of my knowledge at least, is our nation's first Indian American cabinet level officer. That's a big deal for, uh, for Indian Americans throughout this country. Uh, and now she's able to get to work representing our nation uh, as our nation's top diplomat. In just a few minutes, the President will be departing the White House to visit the Department of Homeland Security. Well, he'll, as I mentioned, he'll attend the swearing in of Secretary Kelly, but then be briefed by FEMA on the storm relief efforts in the southeast and conduct other related business specific to keeping our nation safe. Secretary Kelly has dedicated his life to protecting our country, enlisting in the Marine Corps in 1970, commanding at every level from platoon commander through the corps level and com combatant command. He has a sincere commitment to fighting the threat of terrorism inside of our country and ending the dangerous flow of illegal immigrants through our borders. The President's looking forward to working with Secretary Kelly to implement his plans to restore our borders and protect our country. For everyone keeping score at home, this brings us up to four total confirmations of our Cabinet or Cabinet level appointees. And as a reminder, the Obama administration had 12 done at the end of their first week. So needless to say, uh, we think Senate Democrats should continue to spend some quality time getting our nominations moved out of the Senate. All right, let me stop him right there. He took a shot at the Democrats. If uh, it was so important for all of these people to be uh, nominated, confirmed, and sworn in, Kelly, uh, along with Mathis, were approved last Friday. Mathis uh, was sworn in, I believe, on Saturday. Okay? Pompano was held up until Monday. And the White House and the Republicans were jumping up and down like crazy as far as uh, putting forth and uh, confirming uh, Pompano. But Mathis was approved last Friday, and he's not being sworn in until today, Thursday. So w six days before um, he actually gets uh, sworn in, and that's not a big deal, but it's a big deal that Pompano uh, had to wait the three days uh, for his confirmation. If Trump was so uh, hot to trot about getting these guys on board, why wasn't uh, Ma why wasn't uh, Kelly sworn in basically the same day that uh, Mathis was sworn in? Just some food for thought.
This afternoon, the president will uh, have his final uh, event, public event anyway, uh, by speaking on the phone with Mississippi Governor Bryant. They're going to discuss storm relief and recovery efforts underway in Mississippi and any help that the, that the governor needs from the federal government. Uh, today, the, uh, the president also announced the appointment of an incredibly qualified team to serve under the guidance of White House Counsel Don McGahn to address compliance and ethics uh, matters. This team consists of Stefan Pasatino, Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy General Counsel to the President, Udon Dillon, Scott Gast, and James Schultz as Special Assistants to the President and Associate Counsel. Together, these esteemed lawyers have decades of experience in, pol in political counsel, serving senators, members of Congress, congressional committees, governors, and federal agencies. The appointment of a team of this caliber at such a high level reflects the critical importance of ethics compliance to President Trump and his administration. Stefan has received the highest praise from party leaders of both sides from whom he has worked with. Uh, as former Gingrich said, no one understands the ethics process better than Stefan. And as you saw from his tweet this morning, the president is looking into various options to address voter fraud. On Thursday, he'll travel uh, to Philadelphia for a retreat with congressional Republicans where, in addition to discussing his legislative agenda, he'll also provide an update on the actions that he's going to be taking in the next few days. And finally, before you ask, because I know it's, uh, it's an issue that's near and dear to me, uh, I was asked yesterday about the status of the invitation of, the Prime, of Prime Minister Kenny from, the, from Ireland to visit the United States on St. Patrick's Day, and I'm pleased to announce that the President has extended that invitation. It happened actually during the transition period, and we look forward to the, uh, the Prime Minister attending. Uh, with that, I'd love to take some questions. Dave Boyer, Washington Times. Okay. Um, it's been pointed out that for whatever reason, at the White House uh, press conferences that instead of the traditional mainstream media outlets being called on first, special emphasis is being given to uh, a lot of these alt-right websites or quote-unquote news organizations. And that, I believe, is at the direction of uh, Steve Bannon. Now, the person uh, that, uh, and I didn't actually, and I'm not going back to get it, um, the person uh, or the organization that uh, Mr. Spencer just called on um, is, act, is obviously an alternate right, or uh, I'm not going to use it on this guy, but uh, a white supremacist uh, website, okay? Okay. Um, and he has done that in all of his press conferences. If you go back, have the ability to go back and look, you'll see the first or second question given at all, all three of the uh, press conferences that Mr. Spencer has given. He has called on uh, Laura Ingram, which is a far right leaning uh, website. She got the first question. He gave a first question to the Christian uh, Broadcast uh, Network uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday, as you just heard, he gave the first question to the Washington Times. All of these are alt-right or far, far right, unknown or little known, Laura Ingram might be a little bit better known, but pretty much little known uh, right wing, uh, if you want to call them that, news organizations. So I believe that they are trying to bring the alt-right uh, into an area of normalcy as far as uh, getting information out to uh, the general public and uh, obviously getting their points of views out there in front of everybody else. All right, let's get the guy's question. Thank you, Sean. Can you shed any light on this draft uh, memo that's going around about interrogation practices right. and return? Yes, I can lend a lot. What agency did it originate in? I don't know. It is not a White House document. And White I would House. just urge those people who have reported on it, uh, this is now, I think, the second day that we've had a document that was not a White House document get reported on as, as a factual document. It is not a White House document. I have no idea where it came from. Uh, but it is not a White House document. Did the president directed that it be drafted in the first place? No. I, I mean, as I said, it is not a White House document. Um, so I'm not sure 
where it came from or how it originated, but it is not a White House document. I don't know how much clearer I can say with that. White House document. And we could potentially take him at his word. But my question is, is the White House, v does the White House have a copy of this document? And are they reviewing the document? You know, he has said that he doesn't know where the document came from. Well, that may or may not be true. So the question is, if it's being purported as being a White House document, which it may or may not be, it could be a document from the Pentagon or uh, CIA or any place else. So that would make it not a White House document. But if they are reviewing that particular document in order to issue an executive order, that's another whole ball game. All right, let's 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 keep going. The uh, Montenegro from Telemundo. Thank you, Sean. Um, with regards to the executive order, the president will be signing today. Uh, with uh, regards to the law, um, it's already been estimated that it will cost billions of dollars. Has the administration figured out how Mexico will pay for this, and do you have any guarantee from? Uh, Republicans in Congress that they will provide all of the funding necessary yeah. to see this project come to completion. Also, uh, about two days ago, you were asked about um, DACA. Yeah. And uh, some of the uh, dreamers, as they are known, have lots of questions regarding what is their future? Right. I mean, do they continue to apply? Those have uh, that applied for renewal, will uh, their applications be processed? And with regards to stripping funding um, from the sanctuary cities, what fundings are we talking about with That's regards a great, to that? Thanks, Lori. I think what the, uh, with respect to the last part of that first, uh, what the executive order does is it directs the secretary to look at ways that the look at funding streams that are going to these cities of federal monies and figure out how we can defund those streams. So part of this is a directive to the secretary to look at those funding streams and then figure out how they can be cut off. So that's that's what the actual order directs them to do. The first part with respect to DACA, I've... Now, I already uh, mentioned, and I guess he keeps saying secretary, he didn't say which one. I'm assuming it's the secretary of the treasury. Um, that if they want to start this uh, fight regarding uh, restricting uh, monies going back to the sanctuary cities, the sanctuary cities are probably within their rights and it probably would go to the Supreme Court to restrict the funds that are going up to the federal government since their funds are being restricted. And it appears that the pe people of these various cities don't have a problem with being sanctuary cities or they would have done something about it. Now, he's getting ready to talk about DACA, and let me preempt him. He, they keep getting asked what the people that are protected under DACA should do, and they never give an answer. Uh, their stock reply is that uh, they want to concentrate on the criminal ele element of the uh, people that are here illegally, and then after they get done with that, um, they would then look at everything else. Well, hell, these people need to plan on what they're going to do going forward because there's no telling how long it's going to take for them to deal with the illegal element. But once you know they get that to what they believe is a manageable level, they're going to start looking towards everyone else. So they, there is direction that is needed as far as the uh, children and I guess now adults that were, are protected under it, uh, what they should do. And he is not going to answer, neither are any of the Republicans in power and neither is the president. So that it's a bullshit answer. If they are going to take actions, they know damn well what they want to do. And if they don't know what they are going to do, then they are piss poor at the uh, planning because they have been talking about deporting 11 million people uh, since the year of the flood. So if they're going to deport 11 million people, they need to say it, okay? And they need to say it up front. Now, in my opinion, there is no way that they can deport 11 million people, but it's low hanging fruit for the, them to go after the people who are registered under DACA. They already have the list. And 
one of the conditions of signing up for DACA was that the list would not be used uh, in order to go after them if conditions changed. But obviously, they're going to break that commitment, you know, if they in fact decide to go after uh, these kids under DACA. And then what about the uh, kids or people right now? The question they're asking the question: Should they register under DACA? Be, okay, and put themselves at jeopardy, or should they stay in the background? I've talked about this a couple days. Uh, the order today doesn't specifically deal with that. We will have further updates uh, on the rest of the president immigration agenda further in the week. But as I've mentioned before, I think the president um, will talk about it in an interview tonight. But his priority is first and foremost uh, people who are in this country that seek to do us harm. Um, and he understands. I mean, the president um, understands the magnitude of this problem. He's a family man. He understands. He has a huge heart. Uh, and he understands the significance of this problem. Uh, but he's going to work through it with his team in a very humane way uh, to make sure that he understand that he respects um, the situation that many of these children are in that were brought here. Uh, but his priority with respect to immigration is first and foremost um, making sure that people who are in this country uh, that are seeking to do us harm or have committed a crime are at the forefront of that. Francesca. Okay, that's his priority. But the priority of the people that are protected under DACA is knowing where the hell they stand and they need to know where the hell they stand right now. Good chambers. No, I think the president's working with Congress uh, and other folks to figure out opportunities for that to happen. There are a lot of funding mechanisms that can be used. Um, at this point, his goal was to get the project started as quickly as possible using existing funds and resources that the department currently has um, and then to move forward and work with Congress on an appropriation schedule. But, um, you know, again, we're here at day three. It's an issue that he has brought up several times uh, with Congress in terms of making sure that we understand, uh, that they understand the need to make sure that that's included in the appropriations process. Now, I got a problem with that because uh, Donald Trump has been uh, screaming for the last year at the top of his lungs and having his crowds go along with him at who's going to pay for it? Mexico. Okay. They should have known on day one walking in the door, particularly given the fact that Mexico has consistently and in an unwavering manner stated that they are not paying for that wall. So since they already know that Mexico is not going to pay for that wall. They should have already known how they were planning on forcing Mexico to pay for that wall. Now, a further update subsequent to uh, this particular uh, press conference. The uh, president of Mexico was supposed to meet with Donald Trump, I believe it's n Thursday of next week. Based on Donald Trump issuing that executive order uh, as far as starting or oh, I guess finding the funding and starting on the construction that, of that wall. The president of Mexico has, I believe his name is uh, Peña Nieto. Yeah, that's, that's his name, Peña Nieto. The president of Mexico has canceled that trip. All right, now he's... Francesca. Thank you, Sean. Uh, could you give us a little bit more of a readout of yesterday's meeting with senators about the Supreme Court justice nominees? How was that list received specifically by Democrats? And has the president wheeled it down to, to three names or one name as we're hearing? Uh, the president is not wheeled it down, at least not, not to the extent that he's willing to share with us, maybe in his mind. He's got that going. Uh, but it's, it's, he's going through the process. He had a very constructive and productive conversation uh, with Senate's leaders yesterday about the advice and consent role that they have, getting their ideas, uh, the principles that they expect. And he was sharing with them um, his, the, the qualities and values that he expects in a judge. Uh, to serve on the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm not going to go further than that, but I would just say it was a very productive and constructive meeting. Eli Stokels. Uh, last night, uh, National Park uh, published tweets that were assigned to the facts about climate change. Uh, and then those tweets disappeared shortly after this. Okay. I'm wondering if this White House had anything to do with that and if there's a broader, as it's been reported by some more <laughs> if there is a broader mandate going out to federal agencies about, uh, you know, stopping, halting speech coming from those agencies. No, no, there's nothing that's come from the White House. Absolutely not. I think in some cases, 
Um, I know in the Park Service, for example, over the weekend, somebody who, who un, an unauthorized user had an old password in the San Francisco office, went in and, and started retweeting inappropriate things that were in violation of their policy. And they direct, I mean, so that the, again, remember, you know, I know this happened in uh, the EPA is another example of, I, I think, some social media contact. The EPA actually violated the Anti-Deficiency Act and the anti-lobbying bans, I think it was a year ago, of the during the Obama administration and the, uh, inappropriately marketing some policies of, of President Obama. And I think they, there's a couple of these agencies that have had problems adhering to their own policies. Um, and I, I would refer you back to them um, as to why why those things are happening, but I know that they are taking steps in both of those two cases to address inappropriate use of social media. All right, uh, let me stop him there. He basically just uh, misdirected. The uh, gentleman was talking about uh, some tweets that put out scientific information regarding uh, climate change and carbon emissions, uh, and actually there were a couple of them. What ended up happening was, number one, um, about a half hour after those uh, tweets went out, okay, and again, they were, you could call them generic uh, tweets, it was just giving out basic information. Their website was taken down, okay, it was put back up approximately an hour later, and I'm sorry, their Twitter account was taken down. It was put back up approximately an hour later, and those tweets had been removed, okay? That particular location, once the site came back up, turned around and tweeted again with additional information. Again, that site was, uh, their Twitter account was taken down, okay? And an hour later, it was put back up. Now, I don't know whether they found the individuals from that particular state park that was putting that information up, okay? But uh, as of today, uh, the site, the Twitter account is still up, but the uh, tweets uh, regarding uh, the uh, CO2 emission information, etc., is not there. Now, let me say this. Um, there are regulations that are out there and they have been there since before Obama as far as uh, the ability to, I guess, hold up or go dark uh, momentarily until the administration that comes into power uh, gets their people in place. That it goes without saying, okay? But the EPA, uh, also went dark, as did another uh, couple of government agencies. But before the EPA went dark, approximately, I want to say, four days ago, they issued a, actually, yeah, it was four days ago. It was the very first time this guy got went on TV defending uh, Trump and the uh, numbers game that they're playing. They went and issued a tweet that was in support of this guy, and there was a huge a backlash against them, okay? And uh, uh, quite a few of uh, their followers uh, were calling them to the carpet for not at least investigating the information that they had put out there. I believe it was the APA, I might be wrong. Now this was just before Trump put two of his guys in charge of that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I conflated it. What it was, was the Voice of America, and I'm gonna do a separate video on that. It wasn't the EPA, it was the Voice of America. They uh, shot out some tweets that were inappropriate according to uh, the various uh, followers that they had, and the right basically is has given us some misinformation, which I'm going to correct in another video that I'm going to do, especially on that. But it appears that there are some people who want to keep their jobs. They know which way the administration is leaning, so they want to at least, I guess, uh, curry some favor. So they started putting out tweets that absolutely uh, should not have been done. But anyway, I'm going to do another video on that one uh, specifically so you can see what I'm talking about. 
sure. Yeah. Hey, John. Uh, has the president reached out to Mayor Emanuel or any Chicago law enforcement authorities to discuss the concerns that he expressed in his tweet last night? Well, he, I mean, he met with Mayor Emanuel during the during the transition, expressed to him um, his support for the city, um, the need to uh, to deal with the crime and the killings that are occurring in Chicago. I mean, I think when President Obama was speaking his farewell address the other day, two people were killed the same day that the president was at his, was in his home city. And I think uh, the president-elect at the time extended his support to Mayor Emanuel uh, to say that the resources of the federal government are here for you. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that, that return call for help has not occurred. All right. Uh, let me uh, give you some uh, further information on that, which he neglected uh, to give us. It is, in fact, true that uh, Ron Emanuel met with Donald Trump back in December regarding the issues in Chicago. But that tweet that Donald Trump issued, and you'll have to uh, find it for yourself, had nothing to do with that. What happened was Ron Emanuel tweeted about Donald Trump paying more attention to the size of his crowds than anything else. And Emanuel said, instead of paying attention to the size of the crowds, he needs to get on with the business of uh, being president of the United States and governing. Donald Trump took exception to that tweet, and that's when he tweeted out the uh, threat to uh, send the uh, federal, the feds, I'm not even going to say what federals, in his words, the feds into Chicago if Rahm Emanuel couldn't get his situation under control. That was a threat. And that threat was made immediately after uh, Bill O'Reilly uh, made comments on his show regarding uh, the uh, situation again in Chicago, which Bill O'Reilly has never been to, and the fact that Rahm Emanuel had sent uh, that particular tweet out. It was minutes later that Donald Trump sent out that threatening tweet. So, and that's what the lady's question uh, was about. And here's Sean Spencer. He's trying to clean it up. Can't clean that one up, buddy. The proximity is too close. Yeah, John. John Roberts. Lynn, I'll get to you. But, I, I, but, but that was very, very enthusiastic, and I appreciate it. <laughs> You're getting an award today. For the record, I very much appreciate it. Respect Lynn. Um, you mentioned this morning, the president's brought this up in the news again, that he wants to launch an investigation into voting the right priorities right. in the 2016 election. Yet, not just, but just to be clear, not just in 2016. I think in terms of registration, where you've got folks on, on rolls that uh, have been deceased or moved or registered in two counties, he, this isn't just about the 26 election. This is about the integrity of our voting system. And there are studies that back up what he tweeted out this morning to suggest that people are registered in multiple states right. and that people who were dead are still on the rolls. But attorneys who are representing the president-elect during the recounts in several states emphatically stated, quote, all available evidence suggests the 2016 election was not tainted by fraud or mistake. So how do you square those two things? I think there's a, there's a lot of states that we didn't compete in where that's not necessarily the case. You'll get Cal okay, I'm sorry. I I'm jumping in here early. He he's just going to uh, stand up there and bullshit his way uh, through the uh, question that was asked. So let me cut to the chase for you. Voter fraud is someone attempting either by mail or in person to vote illegally. That's what voter fraud is. What that gentleman was just referring to was a study that was done back around 2000, I want to say 2012, but it could have gone back as far as 2008, but I believe it was 2012. And uh, the uh, Pew study stated that the voter rolls, okay, uh, had some issues with them, i.e., as was stated, uh, dead people still being on the rolls, uh, people that moved still uh, being on the rolls, i.e., in two states. So like if, I you know, if I'm registered to vote uh, in California and then I move to Texas and I immediately register, of course, I'm going to be on the rolls in two states. Now, 
There is no law that requires you to deregister when you move. And you damn sure can't deregister when you die, or let's say you are, are quote, if you are a convicted felon, uh, but you've, you've done less than two years worth of time because uh, you normally will come off voter rolls if you are inactive uh, in two years or more. But you are still not required by law uh, to uh, deregister. So technically, if you're in one of those states and you're still uh, registered to vote, you could technically go in there and vote. No ifs, ands, or buts. So basically, what they, the only way that they contend that there's voter fraud would be that all of these convicted felons that had served uh, just before uh, they were convicted had registered to vote or voted in an election, uh, were convicted of whatever the crime it was, did less than uh, two years um, in the process from the point that they registered and came out and immediately voted, that's theoretically pretty much the only way that that could go down, okay? But these guys, I'm trying to make a big deal about the fact that the voter rolls themselves are not as up to date as they probably could be or should be. That is not voter fraud. And the majority of the states uh, have indicated that uh, they are doing a much better job in uh, the policing of their polls. As a matter of fact, some states, principally in the South, are going overboard and uh, deleting people who legally have the right to vote and eat without notifying them. So they're creating, you know, a problem for a solution, which in, ten, in turn would lead to not more voting uh, for people who are legally uh, entitled to vote, but a less voting for people that are entitled to vote. California and New York, I'm not sure that those statements were, we didn't look at those two states in particular. I mean, as the president has noted before, he campaigned uh, to win the Electoral College, not the popular vote. He campaigned in places like Iowa. He campaigned extensively to win Maine, too. And I think if you were campaigning to win the popular vote, you don't spend it, you know, with all due respect to my brethren in New England, you don't spend a ton of time in Maine, too, to get that one electoral vote. You would have campaigned more in California, which he didn't. You would have campaigned more in New York, which he didn't. There are big states, very populous states, in er urban areas where you would have spent more time campaigning, but he played the game according to the rules of the game, which is an electoral strategy. That being said, I think when you look at where a lot of potential of the a lot of these issues could have occurred in bigger states um, that's where i think we're going to look but i think there'll be more on that as the week goes on and we'll be able to examine that further and that's all because as he stated and, and they should have left it alone he campaigned to win the electoral college which is who elects him so he knew damn well that he wasn't going to get those votes in California, and he knew he wasn't going to get those votes in New York. So it didn't really make sense for, obviously, for him to go into those states, okay, to try to win and basically waste his money. They should have said, hey, we won. The rules say that the Electoral College uh, makes the decision. That's what we won. She got the popular vote, but we got the Electoral College vote. Live with it, and let's move on. Nope, couldn't do that. I'm sorry, are you right? Let's see. May I ask one question to you? About the EPA and, and other departments that have been told to cease and desist in terms of social media. No, 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 just to be clear, they have not, I, I'm not saying that. I, or suspend. No, 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 I, hold on, no, zero. I, we have not, no, no, okay, but I think I need to make sure that we're, we're clear on this, John. He, they haven't been directed by us to do anything. I think what they, what, from what I understand, is that they've been told within their agencies to adhere to their own policies. But that directive did not come from here. But the question is, does, does the president believe that, that these agencies and some of the federal workforce has become politicized? I, I honestly don't know that we spent a ton of time thinking of that. Uh, well, let me answer the question. People want to get keep their jobs. Trump's in office. They are not going to do something that's going to draw attention to them and put a spotlight on them for their 
to be the possibility that they would be replaced. So yeah, they've been politicized. Uh, we've been fairly busy on other things. Um, it's a good question. I, I don't, I've not asked him that question. I think our focus has pretty much been getting the job done, uh, as you've seen through the meetings that he's had, the work that he's had with members of Congress, union workers, auto, uh, the auto heads, the other business leaders. I mean, his focus has been much more focused on getting the job done than various tweets that are getting tweeted and unleaded. Oh, hold on, sorry, Lynn Sweet. Not that I want to encourage anyone else to get. This is so important to talk about. I'm sure. And President Trump has talked a lot about Chicago. So my question is, he said if Chicago doesn't fix the horrible carnage, I will send in the feds. Would you perhaps share with me a little bit about what is the nature of the federal help that the president has in mind? Agents, uh, law enforcement agents, or National Guard, and what factors will determine if he acts runs? People told us that after the meeting in Trump Tower on December 7th, he, he did tell them things that would help Chicago that he could use, uh, such as some jobs, more cut, prosecutions, and gun laws. Well, I, I think what the president is upset about is turning on the television and seeing Americans get killed by shootings. I think what the president is upset about is turning on the television and seeing the Bill O'Reilly show uh, pointing out uh, that uh, tweet that Rahm Emanuel sent out regarding the president uh, giving or forgetting about uh, losing the numbers game and having to uh, obviously not let the slightest thing go and shooting out that tweet. Uh, seeing people be walking down the street and getting shot down, the president of the United States uh, giving his farewell address and two people being killed that day. Um, and when you look at a city like that, he's had conversations with police officers in Chicago and asked them, you know, what, what is preventing you from solving this? And I think in many cases there are some issues that can be resolved that will help them do their job better to keep the people of Chicago safer. And what he wants to do is provide the resources of the federal government, and it can span a bunch of things. There's no one thing. It can be, you know, there, there can be aid. There can be, if it was requested up through the governor, through the proper channels, that the federal government can provide on a law enforcement basis. But there's other aid that can be extended as well, either through the U.S. Attorney's Office or other means that will ensure that the, the people of Chicago have the resources to feel safe. That That's what he means, Lynn. And, and part of it is that no American, whether or not you live in Chicago or Nebraska, shouldn't feel like you can walk down the streets of a, of a city, of a, of a or this streets of a city in this country and fear for your life. And I think too often that's happening in Chicago. Notice that the, the solutions that he threw out off the top of his head are all law enforcement based solutions. No economic solutions, no gun control solutions, especially gun control uh, across the country and in particular Indiana where uh, you can just uh, turn around, go buy a gun, drive back across the border into Chicago, turn around and sell that gun and be done with it. Everything that he just mentioned is uh, basically putting your foot on the throat of people. And obviously, if you put your foot on the throat of uh, some guilty people, you're going to put your fo foot on the throat of a lot of innocent people. And that's what's going on in Chicago right now. I fear for that uh, consent order uh, that they're under. I think that that's going to be lifted as well as the uh, consent decree in Baltimore, uh, Cleveland, and other cities around the country. Uh, if and when Jeff Sessions gets in there, he's already indicated um, his uh, disdain for those consent decrees. What happens next, just so we know the timetable? I think next is we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get, hopefully get a dialogue started with Mayor Emanuel, um, try to figure out what a path forward can be so that we get, um, we come up with a plan that can keep the people of Chicago safe and help stop, help ease the, ease the problem there. Yes. Thank you, John. But did Mexico's government have any knowledge that this new executive order would be signed today? And do you feel President Trump and President Peña Nieto will be on the same page after they meet next week in terms of who is paying for the wall? Uh, they're not going to be meeting next week, and they damn sure aren't going to be on the same page as far as who's paying for the wall. That's why they're not going to have that meeting. I hope so. Um, I think that they're definitely going to stress not only NAFTA, but the wall. There's a lot of subjects that are going to come up. We have a lot of trade that goes between the two countries. Uh, there's some security, obviously homeland security issues, but there's no question I think NAFTA is going to be big on that list and trade overall. Um, but. 
I, and, and with respect to your first question, I don't think we generally telegraph uh, to, to people who are coming to visit what executive orders we're going to send. Thank you. A couple of questions. Yeah. I want to go back to that draft executive order that would undo some of the restrictions for handling detainees. Has the president seen that draft EO? I'm sorry, the one that he's signing? He no, no, the draft executive order that what? would undo the restrictions on how to handle detainees. I, I guess I, I'm having a hard time you're asking me if a document that's not a White House document he's seen. I don't believe to the best of my knowledge. And so I, I would ask, There's a, a, this is the second day in a row we're getting asked about documents that are floating around and people saying, and, and frankly, reports being published attributing documents to the White House that are not White House documents. Well, I haven't attributed No, no, I'm not saying you. I, 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 do you know if he's seen it? I, to the best of my knowledge, he hasn't seen it. I think he's got a lot of other things. I think he just, I don't think he lied there as far as um, Trump seeing it, but I damn sure think that th there are personnel in the White House that have seen that damn document. And I think the document was prepared for uh, them to review, but somehow it got leaked out there. And now the more I think about it, the more I think if Trump hasn't seen that damn document, Bannon damn sure has, and I believe that's, uh, he has too, so he's probably lying. But notice how pissed off he gets about her pressing on this particular document. <laughs> No, you get one point. So let's not be crazy. I have two more. Since it is floating around, okay. is he considering uh, Christian, don't, that this is a, black sites no, and... I'm not going to start answering hypotheticals about documents that are floating around. That's a ridiculous... You're basically... Okay, Christian, we're going to... Okay, see, and then he just fuck with her. Oh, I'm sorry for the language. He just messed with her. What she said was, since the document is floating around, okay, is he considering doing anything with black sites. So even if the document wasn't floating around, that's a valid question, and he got totally pissed off about it and shut her down. Hunter, 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 no, Hunter Walker, thank you. Hunter, thank you. The president is reportedly going to limit access to the country for visa holders and refugees from Iraq, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Um, will he be taking any steps that will affect people from those countries who are already here, including perhaps registering them or beginning deportations? Okay, real quick, and I'm going to back up on this one a little bit. He's going to give you a Freudian slip. Watch for it. I think we're going to have something. I mean, look, the president's talked. Ex I think we're going to have something. Extensively about extreme vetting. Um, today, and, the, and, and you'll see more action this week on keeping America safe. This has been something he talked about in the inaugural address. He talked about the campaign. Uh, as we get into that implementation of that executive order, we'll have further details. But I think the guiding principle for the president is keeping this country safe and allowing people who are from a country that has a propensity uh, to do us harm to make sure that we take the necessary steps to ensure that the people who come to this country, especially where areas that have a, uh, a predisposition, if you will, um, or a higher degree of, of concern, that we take the appropriate steps to make sure that they're coming to this country for all the right reasons. And I think... Okay, so uh, how come Saudi Arabia uh, isn't on there? Because... Uh, the people that uh, perpetrated 9-11, they, they were from Saudi Arabia, okay? So they sh probably should have been number one on the goddamn list, but of course, uh, we can't restrict travel uh, or people from Saudi Arabia coming into this country because they, quote unquote, are allies. Well, guess what? Yemen was an ally of us as well, but uh, they didn't have any problem putting them on that damn list. And then, well, what about the Netherlands? They're not on that list. And you had tons, tons of terrorists coming out of the Netherlands. They're not on that list either. So that list basically is putting the Muslim world on notice that if you're a Muslim, for the most part, uh, you can't come here. And that is my opinion. We'll have further information on that back uh, later this week. Fraud investigation. What's the ultimate goal here? And essentially, isn't the president questioning the legitimacy of his own election? No, I, I think that the question, look, voting is the most sacred right that we have as Americans. This is what the, is the hallmark and the foundation of our democracy. 
and to ensure that we know that every person's vote counts equally as the next citizen is probably one of the greatest things that we can do. So, is already in place. I, I, part of the reason we need to do a study is to make sure, look, there's, I, I don't want to start throwing out numbers, but there's a lot of people that are dead that are on rolls. There are people that are voting in two places, or that are on the rolls in two different states, sometimes in three different states. Now notice, he started to say that there are a lot of people that are voting in two places, and he caught himself and stopped. Again. Voter fraud is not a person being on the rolls if they're dead. There is no fraudulent act there unless someone comes in and represents themselves as the dead person and that just don't happen, okay? There are probably hundreds of thousands if not millions of people that are registered in multiple states because they move. That also is not voter fraud unless they vote in one state, travel back to the original state that they are, were in and vote there. And there is no evidence of that happening, okay? So they keep coming up with this bullshit voter fraud and it just ain't there. This is all being done because Donald Trump lost the goddamn election by almost 3 million votes. So now magically, he had to have won the popular vote. And that's why he's alleging that uh, there were three to five million illegal aliens, illegal residents who voted. That is absolute bullshit. Excuse my French. I think taking the necessary steps to study uh, and to track what we can do to both understand this, the scope of the problem and then secondly how to stop the problem going forward is something that's definitely clearly in the best interest. John Gizzi. Yeah, the easiest way to stop the majority of the problem is to tell people that uh, or create a law that says if you are going to move that you have to uh, deregister in the state that you are moving from in order to register in the state that you are moving to. That would get rid of a lot of the problem. And um, on uh, people that die, um, the Department of Health uh, needs to uh, issue a, a notification to uh, the registrars uh, of the death of uh, whatever individual so that they can try to match that up and then remove them. That's fraught with peril as well because you know, people being human, more than likely, there'll be a lot of people uh, with similar names that will be removed from the voting uh, rolls uh, mistakenly because of uh, someone else that died. Well, thank you, Sean. Um, two brief questions. First, Congressman Todd Rakita, the Vice President's home state of Indiana, himself a former Secretary of State, is the father of that state's voter ID law, which went to the Supreme Court. He has long advocated other states following the Indiana example, all states adopting voter ID. Right. Is that something the President would get behind? Yeah, I, look, I think the president's number one goal is to make sure that we, I mean, Georgia is another great example of a state that implemented a, a very uh, successful voter ID program. And I think that's what the president's, you know, one of several things. But let's, the first step is, is for him to get this, um, you know, I don't want to call it a task force yet because it's not there yet. But this effort underway that can look at the scope of the problem and then, John, maybe make some recommendations, and maybe it is voter ID in states, but right now we've got 50 states in the territories that all have various different IDs, and, and I know that there's some compliance issues to make sure. Um, but, but part of that is to figure out the, the extent of the problem. In some states, what it takes to get a driver's license might be an issue, and I'm just, but, but I think we have to understand where the problem exists, how, how deep it goes, and then suggest some remedies to it. But right now, to sort of prejudge the process would sort of get in front of the whole need to have it. Paul Bedard. All right, in case you didn't notice, uh, that was an alt-right guy that asked that question. And then there's gonna be another alt-right guy that's gonna jump in here as well. Um, it's come to my attention that the White House, under the direction of Steve Bannon, has issued more press credentials to a bunch of these alternate white or white supremacist uh, websites 
um, in order to uh, get their questions in, in order for uh, Mr. Uh, Spencer uh, to uh, give them uh, shine as far as their positions are concerned. I have a second question. Next week is the National Prayer Breakfast, John, and presidents from Eisenhower to Fresno. Be glad to check on that. I just don't have the president's schedule for the next week. So I, I will get, I, 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 hold on a second, Paul Bedard. Here's another alt-right guy. Uh, Sean, what will, the, what will the White House presidents do on immigration to sanctuary cities and sanctuary counties? They say, go ahead, keep your money. We don't care. We're going we're gonna to harbor uh, these, uh, these illegal criminals. And also, what do you do about countries that pretty much say the same thing who won't allow those people to come back into their country? Well, I think the first step, Paul, is the, the funding piece. And again, this is a multi-step problem. And it's why you've started to see different executive orders get rolled out. And then there's, you know, a congressional piece that we have to do legislatively. But to the extent that the president can continue to identify areas that he can handle within executive actions and orders and memoranda to get, start curbing the problem of executive, uh, of, of illegal immigration. But also, again, it's, it's about, it's, it's a, we talked a little bit about yesterday in terms of funding. There's a taxpayer issue here. You know, you've got um, the American people out there working and then having their money sent to places where folks that aren't in this country legally are getting sent to cities uh, that are therefore using their tax dollars. That's a part of it. So it's not a one-step solution. I think that's why you've got the wall. You've got some funding issues. You've got uh, the, the vetting. But it is not a one-step process. It's going to be a multi-tiered, multi-step uh, uh, problem. Okay, now uh, let me just uh, give you a little bit of a clarification on my personal opinion. Um, there is, most of the established journalists, they're, they're the ones that are basically seated, okay? And it appears over the past three days that somebody's gotten kicked out of a seat and at least one alt-right person has been given a seat, either, uh, in the first row or the second row, and they've been given that first question. The majority of the other alt-right or far-right people uh, that are new to the scene, those are the ones that are all around the sides and the back. And the last two gentlemen that asked questions, those guys were both alt-right guys. And he knew their names and knew to call on them. Sean, on the Supreme Court, what is the president? of Judge Gorsuch, uh, he's, he's a name that's been circulated. Right. And then more broadly, does the president feel like the choice should be someone who are, is in their late 40s, early 50s as a way of leaving his imprint on the court? I, I think that there have been several names that uh, have been floated out there. Uh, he put out the list a while ago of, of 20 or so. That's where I would look. I'm, I'm definitely not getting ahead of the president on, on this. Uh, but I would suggest to you that the people that are on that list that he put out during the campaign represent the kind of people that he's not just going to represent or he's not going to nominate for the Supreme Court, but we have well over 100, I think it's 103 uh, vacancies at the, at the federal level um, and at the appellate level. And I think that's going to continue to guide him. Margaret. Sean, um, one point of personal privilege. Can we get the text of the executive orders when the president makes the announcement? Yes. That would help In fact, I will tell you this with Margaret. I was just told the president is about to speak. I will get you the executive orders ASAP. Thank you guys very much. Real quick, hold on, hold on. Real quick. Okay. All right, so that's the end of uh, the press conference. So those are just my opinions on what's going on here. You got to pay really close attention to what this guy's saying and the answers that he gives. And also, you got to do your own research to realize when this guy is blowing smoke up your butt because. Half of the answers that he gave, he was basically blowing smoke or he basically dodged and didn't answer the questions. So I'm, I'm going to do my best to, uh, to watch everybody because it's not just uh, the guys on the right that are blowing smoke. The guys on the left are embellishing as well. And um, the next video I do, I'm going to give you an example uh, with uh, MSNBC uh, Rachel Maddow.